Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we saw you on the march on Saturday, and I just wanted to get your impressions first off about how that event uh, uh, went, really. You know, I was really, I was really excited about it. I mean, there was a commitment all along that we, the faith communities, would be part of uh, the civil society march, and it was organised by the C17 uh, committee, which was a, a grouping of uh, more than 17 uh, civil society organisations. Um, there, were, there was some concern that there were some organisations that were trying to muscle in on the march that weren't uh, necessarily environmental organisations. Mm -hmm. But, for example, Kasatu, um, which is, as you know, is the trade unions, but if they are with us on environmental issues and carrying placards like no nuclear energy, um, then that's all to the good. The, there was a funny game which we didn't know about because uh, when we arrived before other people arrived, there was this great group of about 200 people all dressed in green and saying um, climate change volunteers and, and I was saying, you know, quoting Jesus, those who are not against us are, are for us. Uh -huh. And I thought that's wonderful, they're there. And then suddenly they tried to take over leadership of the, of the march. So we don't know where that came from. But, but you know, the World Summit in uh, 2002, there were two separate marches. Civil society was divided. This time we were, we were united and we are united in our call to the leaders of the world, the political leaders of the world, that they have got to come to a meaningful, I would say meaningful binding agreement that, that gets us somewhere. And I say it's got to be binding because, you know, most people, if they can get away, say, with not paying their taxes, they won't pay their taxes. And it's the same with nations. You know, we've, nations have got to say, yes, we will fulfill our commitments. And in our petition, to which we signed and presented to the president of COP, we have said, first and foremost, world leaders, you've got to be honest. Now, some people have said, asking the politicians to be honest. And, and we're saying, yes, because you can't deceive nature. If we try and play games with nature, we will continue to pay the consequences. And that is the, the huge issue, because we're actually playing with, uh, it's more than fire, we're playing with our future. Um, and, and that's why it is so serious. Uh, some scientists are saying now we've got only a 50% chance of keeping average global temperatures below two degrees. Now, if you were to climb on an aeroplane with the prospect of having 50% chance of arriving, you wouldn't climb on that aeroplane. But we are ready to gamble the future of this planet and well-being on this planet, um, you know, on, on, on at, at a 50% chance. Why are we, the faith communities, in, involved? I think you wanted to ask us that. And we had one communications uh, conference where, with the subject, what has God got to do with it? And I said there, God has got everything to do with it. Because uh, we, uh, as Christians, believe that God is the author of all creation. Now, that doesn't mean to say that I believe he did it in seven days, because I'm quite sure he didn't. You know, I think we, we, we strongly believe in, in, uh, in evolution, this incredible creative process. So it's taken 15 and a half billion years to get to this incredible planet that we've got now. But we humans are now rapidly unraveling it, and, 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 and therefore we have been totally disobedient to God. We are, we are destroying this creation which we believe God has brought into being. And, and so we've got a huge responsibility. And, and why I also hope and pray that the faith communities are going to become increasingly involved is, is let's reflect on slavery and William Wilberforce that brought around this radical change. And the opposition Wilberforce had in England from the business fraternity, from other MPs. Oh, you know, England's economy was going to collapse without slavery. Do you know that? You know, that's why they opposed it. We have to have slaves to keep our economy going. Same today, the carbon chaps are saying, our world economy is going to collapse without oil and coal. Actually, the world did quite well, much more healthily, before we had all this incredible source of energy. But we're not saying we don't want to do without energy. We're saying use today's energy and not millions of years old energy, which is polluting. And God has given us all the energy we need from the sun and the wind. All we have to do is harness it. And we have the capacity and the technology to do it now. We just have to have the political will.
And is this an issue which is animating faith communities, do you think? We've, we've heard uh, quotes come out from, from the Pope in recent weeks and then a, 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 a big uh, march here this weekend. But is it, is it really at the top of the agenda for them? It's, it's not yet. I have to, I think we've got to confess that, that it's not. And I think it's very disturbing that there are an awful lot of faiths and, 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 and maybe the Christians especially that still concentrate on individual salvation and getting people to heaven. Now, why are they wanting just to concentrate on getting us to heaven? Uh, you know, it's, it's this world that God has placed us in and sent from, from our point of view, send Jesus Christ down here, that we bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And Christian Aid has a very good slogan, we believe in life before death. And it's this life here and now. And, and you know, I think it's very unfortunate that there's a huge emphasis from some religious quarters some, and some Christian quarters that continue to emphasize this individualism and even that sort of prosperity cult. And, and that is, I'd almost say it's a heresy. Um, so we really hope that, and, and I think increasingly, faith communities are recognizing that actually we have been given, we have been tasked by God to look after this creation and to look after one another on this creation. And do you think faith might be an effective way to communicate climate change issues? Do you think it might be a way to engage people who might otherwise not uh, engage with this issue? Well, why we think it's so important to get faith involved is that we've got the largest networks in the world. You know, and, 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 and we've got more credibility, I hope, than politicians. So we really want to bring uh, our faith communities on board. And, and I think increasingly, uh, you know, the, the, the churches and the faith communities, the papacy, the Anglican Church, I think, has been very strong in this area. Um, and, and our own Archbishop of Cape Town is now the convener of the Anglican Communion Environment Network. And he's been quite outspoken for environmental justice. And, and so it is, and the, and the ecumenical patriarch, uh, the, the Orthodox churches have been very strong. So we really hope that, um, that it is going to continue. And, and my prayer is that the strong, the, what they call the mega churches, you know, the strong Pentecostal and uh, charismatic and, and evangelical churches will also recognize that actually, uh, that, that caring for the environment is a core gospel issue. And we're, of course, we're standing in Durban in a city in a country which is, uh, has a rich history of, of um, uh, human rights activism and activism more broadly. Do you think that that's going to take off here? Do you think this is going to be a place where environmental activism is going to take off? It is. It is, yes. Um, but it's still beginning. You know, I mean, people, people are still self-centered. And we're concerned about our rights, our wages. Our government is, is saying we've got to overcome poverty and unemployment quite rightly. But the great secret is that if we uh, really turn to renewable energy and, and, and turning to make the planet healthier, we will create far more jobs. You know, what does most people out of jobs? It's machines. It's machines driven by fossil fuel. And so if we can get, a, get onto a low carbon economy, uh, intermediate technology, um, you know, South Africa has millions of unemployed young people who are unskilled. And, and so let's, let's provide the jobs that are going to bring them into the main economy. But you say, why isn't it happening? And it's not happening because those, uh, who, the, the captains of industry, are interested in their capital investments and machines are much more obedient than people <laughs> and, and, and so you're going to get a much better return on your machines and we're saying chaps you've got to invest in people and, and that's why we need a paradigm shift in our, in our economic uh, structures that we put people and planet first and not profit. Um, yeah. I'm speaking to leading apartheid activists this week, anti-apartheid mm -hmm. activists this weekend, like um, uh, Kumi Naidu, he's saying mm -hmm. civil disobedience is going to have to play an increasing role here. Is that something that you can see the church falling behind, and is it going to raise some difficult moral questions for you? Well, we really hope that the church is going to give a lead. You know, I mean, a, a huge boost to the, the whole anti-apartheid struggle was when the church declared apartheid a heresy. And we are now saying that, that uh, economic, uh, environmental destruction is a heresy. Uh, the ecumenical patriarch has said that destruction of creation is a, is a sin against God and a crime against humanity. So we're beginning to move in that direction to, to give a moral basis for what has to happen. And, and the, you know, the apartheid was maintained by those who had an interest 
in, in keeping the whites in a privileged position. Today, uh, we have global apartheid with those with power and wealth want to keep the present structures going. Um, but they're leading us to our destruction. We've got to say, chaps, you big coal moguls and your oil moguls, you have to start distributing the wealth. We've got to have a more equitable uh, world system that brings uh, everybody on board. And, and, uh, and we're not going to find peace while we continue with this global apartheid with the rich north saying we want to keep the wealth to ourselves um, and we don't mind what happens in the third world. We might have a little bit of charity going down there. And we've got to say justice has to be applied to the planet and to people. And then we will find peace. We, South Africa couldn't find peace while we had the injustice of apartheid. We had to as, uh, abolish apartheid, get rid of that unjust structure. And the same in the world today. We have to get rid of the injustices of our present global apartheid uh, economic system. And people look back on uh, issues like slavery, on issues like apartheid, with a sense of um, kind of moral aberration. Do you think people will look back on climate change with a similar perspective? What will people say in 50, 100 years' time? Not 50 years. Our children will say, how could we be so irresponsible and, in fact, immoral to allow half the species of this planet to become extinct, never to be brought back again? How could we do it because we maybe wanted a bigger car or a more luxurious lifestyle that we then jeopardized their future? It is a deeply moral issue, and, we, and we've got to recognize that fast, because um, the longer we delay, the worse it's going to be. And, and I heard a report from uh, Jonathan Pershing, the uh, United States chief negotiator, saying that, all right, if America doesn't sign immediately, you know, we're just going to have to increase our, our, um, decrease our emissions more sharply in a few years' time. How, what is the right to say we can continue to pour millions of tons into the atmosphere for the next 100 years they're going to be there, those uh, the carbon emissions. Um, and and we, can't, we can't bring those back. We have got to start, from next year, we have got to start reducing carbon emissions if we're going to, to keep uh, global average temperatures below. Uh, we are now saying 1.5 degrees. And, and that's terrifying for us as well because it's already the scientists are saying that Africa's average global temperature is going to be twice as much as the world average global temperature increase. Bishop Davies, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you. All, all strength.